Loading our tissues isn't a choice, it's a necessity. Mechanotransduction is a fancy word that means our tissues need physical and mechanical input in order to organize correctly at a cellular level. If we want strong feet, we need to load them. If we want robust spinal discs, you guessed it, we need to load them. Bones, muscles, tendons, and ligaments, and fascia actually only get stronger if you load them. Remember, it wasn't that long ago as a species that we walked and moved more. We can change this sentence to be, it wasn't that long ago as a species that we loaded more. We loaded a lot more. Welcome to Glorious Professionals, episode 26, brought to you by GoRuck Media. I'm Jason here with Rich. Our guest today is Dr. Kelly Starrett, a physical therapist and coach, and an expert in the field of human performance. He's the author of several books, including Supple Leopard, and the co-founder with his wife, Juliet, of The Ready State. Bottom line, I've followed him for years. When he talks, I listen, and we're really excited to get his take on rucking and overall how to be a healthier human being. Kelly, thanks for joining us. Super major pleasure, as always, my friend. All right, so I want to go back to the beginning to, to sort of how you formed a lot of what, what's brought you to, to be the supple leopard and, and where you are now. I get the sense that growing up, you, you were pushing the envelope fr from time to time. You were, you were out trying to get, get after it in life. I know you grew up in Southern Germany. How was that like growing up a, a kid there? You always had a backpack. It was always loaded, honestly, because I grew up, my, my single working professor mom was always dating a mountain guide. Like that was, you know, those were, it was a kind of a big expatriate community. That's where the 10th mountain division was trained. And so, um, uh, these guides would basically t work with the military on, you know, simple mountain survival, mountain movement, things like that. And I discovered early on that weather was always changing. There was no cell phone. I had to be home at dark, which meant in a single day, I might ride my bike to Austria. I might hike in the mountains. I might like, we, we, always had a go pack and it was not a big deal that every one of us had a pack with an umbrella in it we had our spear you know uh, something warm on we had a snack that lived in the bottom we were just always ready to go and um i'm really grateful for that 70s 80s freedom of being able to run around wild drink from the hose give yourself heat stroke recover in the shade then do it again and uh, we did that a lot and you, you mean you didn't buy two dollar eight ounce bottle of water back then uh, there was less of that. There was, I, I think I would have, but I think what you really bring up in that moment is we are a product of our environment. What does our environment say about us? You know, right now we're, we're seeing that people's systems aren't really that robust. Don't know how to exercise. This is not their fault. They've never been taught. Don't know how to eat. Don't know how to load. You know how to train our children. So the, the question is really, you know, how do we reconcile all of this information about best practice right now, because it is, it's an embarrassment of riches. But at the same time, if we go back to E.O. Wilson, who is like my ultimate hero, the father of evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, says that the highest calling of science is to serve the humanities. So if I take all the things we've learned in sports and performance, nutrition, and I say, well, let's just turn around and look at our society. How are we doing? Are we, are we happier? Are we in less pain? Do we feel closer to people? Are we more disconnected? Dude, we are failing in almost every measure. So what's going to change? We got to change something. It's not working. All right. So I, I want to I really get into a lot of this. I, I also want to understand how you got to where you are now. You, you grew up with a single mom, right? Yep. So, so did I. We, we talked about this a little bit. I, I did as well. My mom was 18 when she had me. And you know, and, and then you moved to America, you, you got an education, you got more education and more education on top of your sort of push, pushing the envelope of, of human performance at, at a young age. I mean, a lot, a lot of time in the water, right? We, uh, I discovered kayak, whitewater kayaking early on when I was 12 years old. It was sort of the rite of passage. You know, I just was like, all right, I guess I learned to kayak now. And uh, fast forward where I caught the bubble of whitewater kayaking in the 90s and early 2000s. And was fortunate enough to find a tribe in a community that valued the outdoors, that valued risk-taking, that valued self-reliance, and, and it didn't take a lot of money. That was the other thing. We, we were all critically poor, but when we decided to go run a, a river, you know, 
might be an overnight. It might be self-support. We had to, it was a 12 mile hike to, to do the, the shuttle, you know, like we, maybe you hitchhiked and maybe you walked. We stuffed seven layer burritos from Taco Bell in the bottom of our bags because we knew they'd last 24 hours and they were like the most calorically dense food we could get. And we got really comfortable taking risk and relying on each other to have each other's backs. Yeah. So what was the dynamic of that tribe? Right. Cause I like, this is, this is huge for us. Cause you get into special forces, it's a tribe. And some of that's been lost as we fast forward to what we're going to talk about in a bit. But I mean, what was that like? I can feel what that feels like with, with you describing it. Yeah. You know, uh, let me give you an example. There's a, there's a dyad right now of women who are heading to the Olympics, one in road bike, one in mountain bike. They're both two of the nation's best cyclists, world champions, world record, uh, world cup champions. And I see them train together, Kate Courtney and Kitty Hall, both incredible local riders, some of the best athletes I know. And every time they compete together, train together, I feel jealous. Like, that's what I feel. Like, I know what it's like to be on a mission with your friends. And we went to the gym together. We put, you know, carried stuff in our packs to get ready to carry stuff in our packs. We just all had this kind of common bond about how much money do we have to get shared resources to get to the destination, right? I drove a 72 Ford Bronco. It took me till my senior year in high school to save for that car. And, uh, you know, I used to take the bus to high school as a senior. It was really embarrassing to get on. The, but that was, that was my game. I was, it took me forever. So I worshiped this car. This car was freedom. And then we were gone in the mountains whenever we could. You know, I went to school. I went to university in Boulder. And we were all river guides and, and kayak instructors in the summer. And that two things happened out of that is one is that we had pride in our work. We were the best guides out there. We we're the most pro guides, the most experienced guides. So interesting in that is that we were responsible for a lot of civilian lives all the time, you know, and the punters is what we call people, customers, MERS, you know, like people would come with us for a two day adventure on some class five and, you know, I'm 20 years old. It's fine. I'll work it out. I mean, like what could go wrong? And, uh, you know, to show up, and to usher someone through that experience over and over again was really foundational. And then every free second we had off the river at six, on the river at 6.30 in PM, you know, trying to get one more run in, run a little class five, challenge ourselves. We were really looking for something, I think, to break ourselves against. And we, that, that thing that we were trying to break ourselves against was our own fear. And, and you know, we did that repetitively for many, many, many years and we had some friends die and it was, you know, very, very serious. And we took it as a calling. And what's really interesting is that when I moved away from Durango, where I was living, when I met my wife, Juliet, I moved to San Francisco. I thought I would never have that tribe again, that I would never have that, that comfort of communication, of being able to body read, of being able to rely on someone if I messed up I and mean, just, just what it feels like, you know, and, and lo and behold, I, I have discovered that group of people again. It's just a little bit different. But I mean, I think that is one of the things that is absolutely missing from the human experience right now is that you're in a group of people who have your back and you're on a common, you're on a common cause. All right. So let's, let's sort of, this is one of those lessons they taught my wife, right? Which means that she, she teaches me, you know, that's how it works. It's a uh, PT buff, put the benefits up front, right? What's most important to someone? who wants to be healthy in, in your eyes? Like what are, what are brilliance in the basics? What do people need to do? I think it's so easy to get caught up in the minutia, right? If I take this turmeric and I do this secret squat program, everything is going to end up, I'll win fitness, right? And I think if we view things through this lens of finite versus infinite game, right? A finite game has clear winners and losers, clear rules, and uh, it has a clear time domain. And, and that's how most of us approach the tasks at hand, whether it's sport, business, life, family, is that we, we're sort of playing under those rules that this is a, fin a finite game. These games are infinite, which means that you don't know the duration, you don't know the rules, the rules are going to change, the players are going to change. And the only way you can be successful in an infinite game is to play better than you did yesterday and to keep everyone else in play. And so I'll come back to that thing. How do you know when you've won fitness, when you have got the perfect abs for Instagram for one second, 
you know, and then you eat a pizza and it's gone or you get injured because you're actually using your body for something and, you know, you have to rebuild. So you can't win fitness. Do you win relationships? I mean, you're married. I'm married. I don't know if you're married, Rich, but uh, I no, I I definitely won a few years ago and then haven't won ever since. No, I'm a, I, I don't. You don't can't approach your relationship that way. Business is the same. And what we see is, if we run everything through that filter of that, this is a game to be played and won. We'll always be unhappy and they'll never feel like there's process or progress in the process. And so if we have to pan back for a second and say, what is the goal? So the goal for us is to make it to 110 years old with as much physical capacity and as much option and movement choice as we can. And some of us, we have injury histories. We had jobs that took something away from us. Or, But if we're being honest, the first things come back into the basics, which is you got to move your body every day. Do you feel safe? Do you have a tribe of people? Or do you feel connected to other human beings? Do you sleep? Yes or no? And I don't believe you that you're sleeping. I think it's all horseshit. I think that you're not sleeping. So now I have to be like, okay, show me your sleep numbers. Then we can talk about it. Do you eat whole foods? We're arguing about how many grams of protein you need versus the fact that you aren't even eating things that your grandparents would identify as food. Then start to layer in the fact that you don't use your body in the way it is. You're not loading. And all of a sudden, I, I can't even tell what the output is because there's so much noise in the system. So first things first are to take care of those unsexy basics and then add things back in. And I think that's, you know, we're in this life of removing things either like we just we deprive ourselves or. We are making so many checklists of stuff we got to do that we don't experience it. We don't understand that if you take care of the first principles, the first foundations, then you're going to have choice and you'll be able to play a much better game. So if I ask people like, you know, what is your, what is your fitness goal? They're like, I don't know, look good naked. I'm like, well, that's, that's a reasonable goal, but really doesn't get us very far because I can calorie restrict you and, you know, whatever we want to get you there. But Really, when you when you nailed it, occupy your role in society. What is it you want to do? How do you relate in your community? How do we make you feel better? And, and our hypothesis is that most of us don't feel as good as we realize we can feel. We're, we're, not, we're not doing what we're capable of doing. And we're just leading demi-lives. We're just kind of blundering through. And that's, that's crappy. You're a human being. All right. So what's, what's the most foundation? I mean, like just the basics. Community, movement. Add some weight to it. So it, since, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about pain and I saw a lot of time about the fact that you can't do what your body is supposed to do. Those two things, right? Your car is supposed to be able to turn left. Your car doesn't turn left. You know, you can still drive it and keep turning to the right and you can back up and go forward and turn to the right. It's like one of those old remote control cars from the seventies, but your car should turn left and right. So what are we talking about? Why, why are you arguing with me that your ankles aren't ankles anymore? Like, what are we talking about? Why aren't you caring about that? Well, you don't care because it's not limiting you or you're not realizing the implications on that. And to get to the bottom of that, the first thing I would say, the dyad of you've got to walk every day, you've got to move your body some every day. Like Juliet and I really have come to believe that 10 to 12,000 steps is the goal. Some days you're only going to get six. That's fine. You know, we've been in elite military groups that, you know, they solve sleep problems. I, I, don't, I don't think people realize how interconnected the system is. I think this is one of the problems is that you get a bad night's sleep, right? Or you run an Ambien and Adderall and you, you can't fall asleep. So you at four o'clock, you have a massive caffeine bolus and maybe you sneak an espresso at six and then you're ready to go to bed and you can't hit the brakes as you're, you haven't moved very enough and you're a little sleepy. So you hit some alcohol or whatever you're doing to downregulate or THC or whatever it is, no judgments. It's just you trying to self-soothe. You have a crappy night's sleep, and the next day, you're even worse off. We get caught in this cycling. In the military, it's ambient Adderall. In professional sports, it's Adam, ambient and Adderall. And for most people, it's alcohol and caffeine. Right? Whatever your combination is, what we fail to appreciate is that, man, if I have caffeine after four, I'm not gonna, I'll sleep, but I won't sleep as well. And that means the next day, I haven't adapted, I haven't recovered, I'm not ready to go after it again, and I'm a little sleepier, and I get caught in this cycle. Kirk Parsley said recently that the average sleep for the American two years ago was 6.4 hours. Last year was 6.2 hours. Anything under, we consider anything under seven hours of sleep a night is threshold for survival. 
That's threshold. I know people are always like, Bill Clinton only slept four hours a night. And I'm like, Bill Clinton died of a heart attack. So what was your question again? Then, you know, no, I know you can do it. I know, I know the guy on your left, he, has, he went for years without actually sleeping and he has no hair and you now he regrets it. But, um, <laughs> but the point is that if you're serious about playing this long game, you will prioritize eight hours of sleep every night. You will make it your like core mission to get eight hours of sleep, which means you may need to be in bed nine hours. Now, what you're saying is I have a job. I have, I have newborn kids. I'm screwed. I'm like, yeah, that's right. So you can't control it. So you're going to control what you can control and get that eight hours when you can. Second, you got to walk. Those are the two things that I think are non-negotiable every day. You got to move your body. And part of the walking idea is that you've got to accumulate enough non-exercise activity, enough sleep pressure that you actually want to go to sleep. And if you don't move your body, and I'm talking a, a one hour intense exercise session is not the same thing as moving your body all day long, then you're not going to fall asleep. You're not going to stay asleep. And you're going to sleep like crap. And so we fail to appreciate that those two things are linked. So sleep is a huge deal. You got to move your body. Those two things are the core things. However you want to eat, knock yourself out, make it sure that it rhymes with whole food. And then, and then we can talk about what's next. All right. So let's go back in time a little bit. Right. Let's compare ourselves now to, to what, cause, cause we're linked as humans, right? That's kind of a link. You go back and I get it. There's been some evolutions, but not really, not really. Right. I'm a little fatter. Your femur's a little longer. You're the same physiology that you had 10,000 years ago. Right. So, so what is our baseline for, for how did we evolve and adapt as homo sapiens, if you will, because I know we're, we're all brains and we're so smart and stuff and we're all going to, you know, figure out how to live forever in some, you know, Terminator 6 movie or whatever. And that's great. But our bodies are here in this world and they haven't evolved. Yeah. And, and so what's our baseline? How did we evolve? What are we supposed to doing? What did hunter gatherers do? Uh, there's a wonderful book by a gentleman named Philip Beach who wrote a book called Muscles and Meridians. And it's basically for lack of a better word, functional embryology. It's very technical reading. And if you're a lay person, let me sum it up for you. You're designed to sit on the ground, carry stuff, maybe throw stuff and walk around. That's it. That's, that is the game. And, you know, he talks about carrying resources as one of the things that humans are designed to do. You're designed to be loaded through your spine and carry stuff around. Like that is a human trait. Whether you're carrying your baby or you're carrying potatoes or you're carrying an animal carcass or you're carrying stuff in your hand on your way to work, and it's a shovel or a gun or a bow. Like you're supposed to carry stuff and, and, and that's part of the game. Part of the game also we have to appreciate. And again, I don't want to romanticize our Paleolithic friends because their lives were short, nasty, and brut brutish and not great. And coffee's amazing. And those people did not have coffee. But I will tell you that one of the things that we did until recently is we sat on the ground. We sat around campfires. We worked on the ground. We cooked on the ground. We slept on the ground. We interacted on the ground. You've been in a tent in Afghanistan. You sit in chairs. You sit on rugs on the ground and lean up against stuff. Like you'll see that we sit on the ground. In fact, there was some research that even came out. I don't remember where this is from physio school that the cultures that toileted on the ground, sit on the ground, hip disease drops to zero. Lumbar disease drops to zero. Why? Because probably these positions were self-tuning. They helped the body work better. We are designed to sit in these stations. These chairs were all about status. And if you look at the research around the development and evolution of the chair, the head man had a chair so he could sit above everyone else. There was no chairs. And what you're seeing is that we have this fundamental sort of mistake between some of our behaviors today, which are just encoded around us without having to make decision, there's a chair and there's an easy calorie and there's no sunshine. And, you know, I was just hanging out with a couple of pediatric uh, physicians uh, other weekend ago. And I was like, you know, we were laughing about the fact that when my daughter who was born a preemie came out, she, they were like, you got to give her, when they sent her home, they're like, you got to give her these vitamins. And I was like, look at me in the eye and tell me mother's milk is, is incomplete nutrition for my child. And I was like, go ahead, I'm waiting. I'm just waiting to hear this bullshit rationale that mother's milk is imperfect. And they were like, well, I was like, say it. And they're like, 
women in San Francisco do not go in the sun. There's no vitamin D in the mother's milk they give their kids because they don't go in the sun. I was like, okay. So if I put my infant baby in the sun or my wife gets a suntan or exercises outside, I don't have to give her these vitamins. And they were like, nailed it. And that is really the allegory and the metaphor for what's going on with our modern selves is that we have stripped out some of these key principles of seeing in the sun, looking far in the distance, caring things, play, tribe, chill out time. Instead, we've added all of these other technologies like pills or vitamins to get us back to this baseline instead of doing the things that we're supposed to do. And so not in some sort of way where we say, oh, we hate chairs and never do that. No. And when you're in a meeting, make sure that you get every- You should see my mid-century modern chair. I mean, I, <laughs> I love for, I love furniture. I'm in. It's like, what's the right balance? Because you, we live in this world. We can't go back to like Afghanistan, not, not as great of a place as America. Just a fact, right? You That's know, right. there's so much stuff that we have. And yet, what's the balance between how, how do you do it? So the balance is keeping in mind that the chair is not the problem. The rest of your environmental life self is the problem. You, let's start with this other assumption. So a couple key competing ideas. The first is I'm an anti-fragile, adaptation, robust human machine. My brain is the most sophisticated structure in the known universe attached to a physiology that is too complex to model right? Good. So that's your body. It is, an ex it, it is extraordinary and unbroken. He gets he's shot down. He survives the raft, right? He is captured by the Japanese and tortured, right? He fractures his ankle. He was an Olympic runner. I think he ran like a 402 mile. That was his best mile, 402. Well, after the war, he came back and ran a 403 or a 404 mile. He's a second and a half off his all-time best after Surviving like two months in a in a raft, not eating, and and like a year in a concentration camp, being tortured, and he comes back. That's because he is that is his how badass the human is. It is so tolerant of starving, of being broken, of 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 being in austere situations, and yet you pour water onto it, and it's like that plant you had in college, and it comes back to life. So, number one, you are an amazing animal. Number two. What were the things that were common amongst all cultures and behaviors for the last 10,000 years? Well, it turns out walking is one of them. It turns out a lot of sleep is one of them. It turns out eating whole foods is one of them. And so what you can suddenly do is kind of parse through. You know, one of our friends, Kate Shanahan, who wrote a book called Deep Nutrition, went back into sort of all the historical cultural diets and was like, what is the common thread here? Some animals, human animals, are able to eat raw milk, dairy, whole, like whole raw milk, dairy. Some of us can tolerate that very well. We all cooked our, our food on the bone because we needed all of that collagen. All of those minerals leached out from the things. We all eat kind of offal. We eat nose to tail. We eat the entire animal, all the organs, all of that stuff. And we ate 40 to 60 vegetables and fruits in a, in a year. And so and there were no industrial seed oils. And so suddenly you're like, holy moly, this is pretty simple, right? Because we can take those best practices out of martial arts, out of gymnastics, out of Olympic lifting, out of functional fitness. And we can start to say what is essential here about making a robust, capable human. Then which dial do I want to turn up? so that I can walk a little further or I can carry a little bigger load or lift a little heavier thing or, right? That's the interesting conversation. And that's the only conversation we should be having. Right. So, so foundational is have your tribe. I mean, I'm, we're, we're huge on this because, you know, the, the Patrick Batemans of the world working out in front of the mirror so they can look perfect in American psycho and stuff. Like it's great, but you're, you're going to be really unhappy. Like your, your, your goals are just wrong. Well, you know, let me put it this way. I'm, I'm living this right now. I have two daughters. One of them is turning 12 here in a couple of weeks. The other one's 15, going to be a sophomore. And I constantly mean like, why don't you want to go deadlift and sprint the hill? Like, what's wrong with you? What, like, what, you know? And they're like, dad, it's so boring. I'm like, let's do just some bike intervals. Like, let's go suffer. And the only thing that they give a crap about is I'm on the team. The team is sprinting intervals and swimming. My, both my daughters play water polo. They are not afraid of hard work. But today, 
they you know they can't throw the ball in the pool they can't take shots they can't scrimmage but they can do ball work and 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 laps and they swam their asses off today you know my my daughter and one of her best friends is in the goalies in there you know varsity players and and they will only do it because it matters in the structure of their society and play and i think that's the point that you're making is that if you want to be successful you got to be in a clan or a tribe or a team or in a group of people who will motivate you and keep you accountable and give it context. And that's where we've lost our minds. That's why Peloton works because you're in a virtual community at the least. And while I'm worried about these things like the mirror where you're exercising with some kind of avatar, that doesn't have any context. I mean, that is, that's the equivalent of saying, eat this protein bar. This is all you, it's soil and green, like eat this thing. It is the minimum therapeutic dose to keep you alive as a human being, but has nothing to do with being a human being. Yeah. I mean, do you really think that, that online communities, to me, if you say community, it means hunter gatherer stuff is, is foundational. When you start to say, oh, well, it's an online community. I, I think there's an expiration date for the human brain in terms of what you'll actually accept as a community, even if you don't realize that yet like you need human interaction in the real world <laughs> we call it 3d now oh you're in 3d i mean that's how pathetic it is right and I, I think you're absolutely right and here here's the case beginning of the covid shutdown you did a bunch of zoom like happy hours with your coworkers, and you're like after like two weeks of that you're like this sucks this is bullshit <laughs> right and it's because let me say be clear about this and how my feeling is because my whole life is organized around this People are what's most important. They are the reason we are on earth. Amen. That is it. Whether you take the vow of the Bodhisattva, whether you are Christian, Jew, Muslim, it is all about, I mean, if we go into the religious texts, Jesus is like, more than one person is there, I'm there, right? You've got to pray together. Praying by yourself is incomplete. Muhammad said the same thing. Buddha said the same thing. It's almost like the, the pearls of understanding of the fact that we need to belong to each other is crucial. You, It is crucial. We were listening to a, a podcast about this woman who did uh, one of those naked and afraids, right? And it was like one of the super naked afraids. So she and her partner, like they had to last like four weeks in the bush. And after like two or three weeks, they got together with another couple that had been trying to survive. And she explained her feeling of camaraderie and human fellowship when she saw another human, which she hadn't seen for weeks, that she wept and she and she felt like I would have died for this person. And you go back into Grossman's work with on killing humans, we are hardwired to need each other and want to belong to each other. So when we engage in behaviors that move us further apart or separate us, it is like ripping at the fabric of our DNA. Yeah, Sebastian Junger tribe. I mean, these are these are great. Like, this is just foundational to me. That's as foundational as you need to move, you need to sleep, you need to eat whole food. It is, and the problem is you can't just say tribe. You got to give people a reason to get together and common cause, common experience. So, you know, the workout in a CrossFit gym is a good example. Like that is a low barrier to entry. But we're gonna do some bike intervals and some pressing. But afterwards, you and I have suffered together. We belong to each other. I have your back. I'll I'll mop up your chalk and you know, like that's how little it takes for people to believe that they're on the same team with someone else. Want to know why football in America exists today? I think because so many middle aged guys that was the only reason or the only time in their life they were truly on a tribe with other men. They suffered together, were shouted at, they went to battle metaphorically, they hurt, right? They had each other's back, they cheered each other on, they lost together. And that experience does not exist ever anymore. So there's this kind of spiritual element to it. No, ah, no, no, no. Forget that. Like that, that makes it, wraps it up in mysticism. It is hardwired in your DNA to need to be with other people who have your back, period. Boom. You say potato, I say potato, Kelly. <laughs> if you want to believe that it's some mystic force that's driving your behavior, welcome to evolutionary psychology. And let me just tell you that it feels so powerful. And I think that's the, I'm not trying to diminish this power, but putting a backpack on and saying, hey, we're going to go hike a distance. We're going to go ruck a distance that we don't know 
how long it's going to take us. It's this open-ended task. There's a little bit of fear, a little bit of uncertainty. At the end of that, it's transformational for people by design. So my wife and I had this for 10 years. We ran a camp for sick kids with HIV. So these kids all had pediatric HIV, AIDS. We took them kayaking for a week. It's an embodied leadership school. That's what we called it. And all we did was show up and say, you have to cook and clean for each other. You have to care for each other. And by the way, we're going to spend the day being scared shitless kayaking. And at the end of that, 100%, my kids went back, became leaders. They became mentors. They, they had perfect blood tests. They went into college. They, things were changed. Why? Because day after day, we took care of each other. We kayaked together. We had common experience. We came through it together. And that's all it takes. I didn't have to journal about my feelings. I didn't have to set up some talking point where we got to manipulate. All we had to do was do together. Okay. So we've talked about foundational stuff, right? Brilliance in the basics, as Rich calls it. Now, when I want to challenge myself and do something significantly more awesome, right? Whether it's, you know, go climb the, the, the tallest mountain or it's go through special forces selection or it's, you know, take your pick, right? How do I, in kind of a whole sense, how do I go after that challenge? Say I want to go climb Say I want to go reenact British SAS selection, at least the, the fan dance part of it in Wales next year. It's, it's, a, it's a hell of an event. He's, he's told me about it, right? Um, so I can ruck a lot. That's great, right? That, that's certainly part of it. Ruck the mountains, add some weight, play around with that. I've, I've done that. I know how to do that. What else can I do in terms of stuff around that sport of, of rucking or moving or walking that's just going to make me less likely to get injured, you know, safer, just also healthier for other sports and other activities as they may, may arise. How, how do I round that out? So such a great question. First of all is if you approach this thing as you're going to win this thing and then it'll be done, wrong approach. The idea is you're going to learn a whole bunch about the preparation and the experience that you will take back to your life. My good friend, I don't know if he, he poached this from, from another uh, brilliant thinker. He says, we win or we learn, right? And this is Dave Spitz of Cal Strength. And I, I don't know if that's a Nelson Mandela quote or whatever, but we win or we learn. And right now I'm like, well, who's winning? So what are we learning, right? And that idea is first and foremost, you're doing this because you're going to learn so much about your preparation and experience and mindset and day of and recovery, all of that that you can take. So your next evolution will be better. Your next iteration of yourself will be better. And this is why I believe, for example, kids have to be in organized sports early on. Whatever that looks like for you and your family, it's individual sports are important, but the number of times I have towed the line on some open task is a million times so that when it really comes to the being a professional athlete or trying to do some really high level thing, it's not your first rodeo. Okay. Second, I want to ask you, how did you do with your basics when your stre life got stressful, when you got work demands, when someone got sick in your family, were you able to maintain your sleep? Did you reach for the alcohol? How did you manage the stress? Did you keep your walking up? Because what I'll tell you is that the more stress you're under, whether it's psychological stress or physical stress, your body doesn't know the difference. It's the same stress response. And the more you intend to go out outside of your comfort zone, the more your basics have to matter. And this is one of the reasons we actually, my wife and I stress test each other, stress test ourselves several times a year. We do some crazy long ride. We do some crazy huge adventure. What we find is that in the training of it and in the doing of it, it exposes all the cracks in our lives, our lies that we're telling ourselves, I eat enough, I sleep enough, I mobilize enough, right? And what you'll see is the more stress you're in, whether that's physical, psycho, emotional, trauma, whatever you're going to call this stress, the basics have to become even more solidified. The easier life is, the more we can flirt around the edge. And the more you expect of your mind, the more you expect of your body, the more you have to protect your sleep. You're going to have to walk to decongest. You're going to have to focus on nutrition and time when you can get it. Then the next conversation is, well, 
You know, lots of ways to train for that. But let's talk about the fact that your body doesn't even do what its body is supposed to do. You don't even have full hip flexion. So when you're going over the obstacle course, man, it's really going to screw you up. All right. So what does that mean? What should I be able to do to demonstrate full hip flexion? Sit on the ground like the guys. So we were, we were in Vietnam together a couple of years ago. You walk around, everyone just sitting. Like they're just in a full squat. It's perfect. It's like my three-year-old's full squat, right? So crazy. You're Everywhere like, you go. So crazy. Like this whole thing, this normal range of motion, this basic body physiology. It's just like, it's like some voodoo. What are we talking about? Why are we talking about the fact that you can't squat on the ground and take a poop? This is crazy to me. And this shows us how far away from the normal tolerances and variances we have drifted. That if sitting on the ground is a problem, how are you going to lower yourself off that ledge? How are you going to jump and land force off a, off a small wall? And what you're seeing is that inadvertently you've taken away choice from yourself. You've taken away movement options. I'm reading a new book by a guy named Franz Bosch, who is probably the most preeminent thinker about motor learning and, and motor mechanics on the planet. He's Dutch. This is called the agility of, uh, or the anatomy of agility. And, you know, to his point is that your brain is highly aware of its movement options and choices. And if you exceed the tolerance of your crappy ankle range of motion, your brain will start to pare down what is possible for you. And what we're trying to do for people is say, at the very least, because you're not, you're, you are living a more complex life, there are some very simple things we can do to keep an eye on your movement basics. So just like we have non-negotiables, we have vital signs in our bodies. We should have movement vital signs. And the problem is you can have me missing 50% of your hip range of motion and still be an ass kicker until you can't, until you fray your labrum, until your back starts to hurt. Like, people have low back pain. You see this all the time, right? This is an epidemic in America. And I'm like, what connects to your back? And they're like, I don't know, my hips. And I'm like, okay, go downstream. And they're like, my legs. I'm like, yeah, isn't it weird that your legs correct, connect directly to your spine via your psoas? So imagine if you have missing hip range of motion, we see that the tail is constantly wagging the dog. Okay, so Kelly, but, but real, like, what do I need to do? What do you need to do? I think you need to spend 10 minutes a day doing some preventive maintenance and self-maintenance on the system. But more importantly, what I want you to appreciate is that every day we move is a diagnostic tool. And this is the key idea is I don't want to add more stuff to your life. I want you to appreciate that if you have a movement practice where you're carrying things and you're squatting up and down and you're, and you're walking around and you're doing movements that are, are functional, right? Which are, it's not even a good term anymore but you're, you're using your body in these full ranges of motion, you'll quickly discover when you fall below a certain minimum. And what we've really tried to do through our teaching, I mean, September is 10 years of me making videos for the internet, 10 years where I'm asking the question, why can't you do what you can do? Why, why aren't you able to, why does your hip not work? Why? I mean, if you and I were having lunch and my elbow got stuck at 90 degrees, right? And you were like, dude, what's wrong with that? And you're like, nothing. But uh, did more pull-ups than you today. But my neck is killing me every time I eat. I have to use these long forks. Right? You'd be like, dude, there's something wrong with your elbow. I'm like, no, I just use more cushion in my shoe. Right? I have to wear a weight belt when I move. I have to, you know, fill in the blank for whatever it is. You'll work it around because you're a human being. So remember, I'm fired up now, but it's not anyone's fault. Everyone is a product of a system product of an organization and what we're going to have to do is change the narrative at this organizational level so everyone understands it's on them if your weapon doesn't fire whose fault is that it's your fault right you probably if you haven't done the preventive maintenance on that thing that is on you so why is it that we're not looking at the primary weapon system as the body and asking why aren't we able to achieve these basic shapes and capacities so let's take it up a notch just for whether it's myself, the GoRuck community, little insider, insider ball here. Let's say that a lot of us feel pretty good about our community. We got our tribe down. Let's, let's assume that sleep's okay. Maybe a little stressed out lately, but sleep's okay. Let's assume we, we have big goals. We, we take on 12, 24 hour events. Let's assume our step counts are good. 
right? A 10,000 and above, eight to 12, take your pick, right? Some of those miles are, are with a ruck on, some are without. Like, as we push ourselves more, say we load even more and more and more, like, what are the things that ruckers specifically should look out for in terms of tightness? Or yeah. like, how, how, would you, how would you craft that response? Remember, um, the first thing that happens when you put in a stimulus is that there's an adaptation response, right? This is why we exercise. We have the stimulus that disrupts homeostasis and our body becomes is anti-fragile and reacts to it. And we have a better body, a better brain afterwards, right? We have a, a learning response. And that learning response may be, I have changes in my efficiency. I have changes in my muscular power, right? I get stronger, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that we know is that after loading, and I'll use loading generically, it could be squats, could be carrying, could be walking up a hill with carrying a pack, it doesn't matter. The first thing your body does is not to make a muscle stronger, it makes the connective tissue structure stronger. So that you start laying down some fiber that allows you to handle those loads and anticipatory uh, nature of the bigger and stronger system. And then the structure becomes stiffer as a byproduct, which is normal. But what we see is there's never a happier sound than a, a pack horse being you know, let off from its load. Well, the same thing is true of the human being. So if I, I finish a big 15 pound ruck, boom, take the backpack off. I'm free. Give me that beer. The rucksack flop, it's called where, where we come from. When you so you go through a long iteration and you just sit back and you lean against your ruck and then you open up your MRE and you, you're just like that. That is a slice of heaven right there. It's a poor heaven, but it's a kind of heaven. It's true. It's true. It's as good as anything else in the world. At that judge moment. not, Kelly. Judge uh, not. Dude, I, I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> carrying my carrying my kayak over the rocks for twelve hours so I can get to the sleep spot. I I have a glimpse of how gnarly it is. But what I'll tell you is, what do you do now to get the machine ready for the next day? And this is where we have an opportunity. So I just spent X number of time on my feet. What was stiff? What was tight? right? The, the body doesn't do that many things. So now what we realize is that if you can just get 10 or 15 minutes of preventive maintenance as part of this cycle, we have found that to be sufficient to really improve the function of the person. All right. So talk to us about the, the ready state and how you, how you all approach mobility, wellness, all functional fitness, all these buzzwords, you know, half of them you, you've kind of created or popularized. And so talk to us about what, what you and Juliet are doing out there in the great state of California to the world. Well, let me apologize for the word mobility. That is definitely my fault. And uh, no one was using that word before. And now it's just ubiquitous and a, substitute, a poor surrogate for even stretching or flexibility. We don't even know what it means. I just saw an insure commercial that had like insure mobility. And I was like, I'm sorry, that's my fault. That's on me. And uh, I saw when I started this process 10 years ago, officially making content was people didn't understand the basics for how their body worked. And also they didn't have a, a rubric or a schema to make themselves feel better, i.e. reduce their pain, change their pain, desensitize their painful areas or restore their positional mechanics. And wrapped in there was also that people didn't know how to get the most out of their exercise buck. How do I maximize this adaptation response? Because if you and I both go ruck 10 miles, but you have an 80% response from that, and I have a 40% response from that, you can imagine how you're going to get better and better and better over time. And I'm wondering why I don't make progress, right? This is why I had to care about sleep, and I had to care about movement, and I had to care about stress and down regulation because what i found was that we were we weren't able to take as big a bite of the apple after these training stimuli all the time so if you go to our site you can see that first of all the idea is it's open-ended the ready state what do you want to get ready for what's important to you and you know in there we've we've got, done three things one you may come because you're in pain and that is the top priority right now let's get you out of pain let's help you manage this give you some tools to appreciate that one pain does not mean tissue trauma or tissue injury necessarily definitely does not necessarily mean tissue damage when you have knee rabies or there's a bone sticking out of your leg it's pretty obvious something's going on the rest of it may be less obvious and there's a whole lot of things you can do without ever seeing a physical therapist a car or a, or a physician so we've got a whole bunch of pain management which is your game 
And we really made this conscious effort, and this is crucial to this community, is that pain is just information. One of our friends from his, his company, Stop Chasing Pain, he says, pain is information, and it's a request for change. And I think when you start appreciating that, and you'll know, I want you to carry the ruck like this for a while on your shoulder. And what you'll see is after a while, it's uncomfortable, right? That's a request for change. So you shift it over here. And after a while, you carry it here, and then you carry it here, and then you shift the loads up, and then you, you move the pack down. All of those little discomforts are, is information about, hey, you should change up this position of this load. That's no different than my knee's a little bit sore, my back's a little bit achy, right? That could be an adaptation error, or it's a request for, let's restore your motion, or you have some stiffness here or congestion that you can manage. So this idea that we wait around till we, we can't occupy our role in society or in the tribe is the old model. I go and go and go and go. I take ibuprofen and hide the problem until I'm ripped out of my community and I'm forced to deal with this at a medical level. We think there's a lot earlier intervention. So pain is a big deal. Range of motion, these basics about restoring your native ability as a human being. Turns out that that is also the game if you want to improve your performance. So the reason I get to work with the All Blacks and the Houston Rockets and the Houston Astros and the Nationals and choose a team, choose a group, choose an organization. When we give people better positions, they have more choice and more movement output, which means I'm moving that ruck at less cost than you, that I am more efficient and have more movement choice and I'm running the whole system at a lower overall kind of operational cost, which means when I get there, I can do two days and three days and four days and five days better than you can. And that has nothing to do with your training. So we're looking about efficiency. And then the last one is really, hey, I've just put my body under some stress. How am I going to speed up and maximize its natural adaptation response? And improving things like down regulation and restoring your ability to so slide and glide and, and moving fluids through your body. That's the name of the game. So that seems all complicated, but you'd be like, pain, recover, range of motion, boom, boom, boom. Really, the idea of the ready state is what's important to you. I want to get up out of bed without back. I want to be able to play with my kids. That's it. I want to be able to go carry this 30-pound plate 50 miles. If that's a little weird, but if that's important to you, it's important to me. And that's what I care about. Thanks, Kel. You got it. I carry a 50 pound pack around and I, I curse your name all the time. It's so great. So, um, you know, so, so the way I've, I've thought about it and you know, my, my sort of physical journey was a lot of trying to figure out how to really push myself, get a little stupid, back off a little bit, not get permanently injured, yeah. keep pushing. Yeah. Cause it was 100%. like, you have to do this or else you're, you're off the team, so to say. Right. So you keep pushing now as you get older and Rich is chuckling, I'm sure at me right, right now, but so, you know, greater range of motion, more circulation, faster recovery. You, you learn these tricks. It's not a silver bullet because those don't really exist. It's just a more holistic way to, to live when you want to perform at whatever tip of the spear that you're, you're on or, or you're chasing. And so you and your teachings have been important. And that's really it. I don't want you to have to take things off the table. And we start to do that. Look, our, our movement choice lives get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is crazy. An excellent predictor of your mortality and morbidity is your ability to get up off the ground without using your hands. So sit cross-legged on the ground, stand up. Want to find out how likely you are to fall or break a hip when you're 70, which is the number one way to die is to break a hip when you're 70, right? Because you end up getting pneumonia and you end up with a nosocomial infection in the hospital. I mean, it's, you lose your reserve. I want you to keep as much reserve and as much bone density, muscle mass, movement options as you can, exactly what you're saying. And it's much easier if we tell the young kids, this is how you run the hottest and go the fastest. It turns out those are the same principles and behaviors that we say to our old aged leopards who are saying, hey, look, I want you to have less pain and still be able to go hard in the paint when it's time to go hard in the paint. Those behaviors shouldn't, they don't change. And, you know, it's much harder to tell an invincible 20-year-old 
that she should keep an eye on her ankle range of motion and not eat that pizza than it is the the 45 year old you know woman who's like whoa what was that you're saying again because my knees hurt all the time and i'm over that right i'd much rather work with the, the older you know special forces guys because they're like hey tell me about that back thing again i, I wasn't listening when i was 20. <laughs> i've been listening very carefully what one of the current concerns i have kelly and jason mentioned it earlier Everybody out there, it seems like our, our entire society, except for a small group of people, are looking for the silver bullet, mm, that there, yeah. there's got to be a silver bullet here that I can take, that I can ingest, that I can do, wh whatever, that's going to be the, the panacea. It's going to answer all of my problems, as opposed to learn yourself, take care of yourself, basically, and then get out there and do the work. Yeah, you know, what's interesting about the Go Rough challenges that you guys put in these community events is that it's almost like we're looking for it. We need it. And people don't even know they need it until they have a taste of it. Fight club. Yeah. Oh, dude, right? Be a little bit scared. You know, one of the reasons I am so pro rucking is that I don't think everyone has the mechanics or the ability or the skill or the tolerance to learn how to run. Should you be able to run? Yeah, your whole life. Of course, that is, that is a skill that, that makes us human beings. Right? You want to know why you have a heel cord? Because it returns 80% of the energy you put into it when you run. That running an 8-minute mile and a 10-minute mile, they turn out to be metabolically the same cost. That every child runs it the same way like Usain Bolt at over 90, you know, foot strikes a minute on the right foot. Like there are some universals. This guy, Franz Bosch says, there is less variance and differentiation in sprinting and there's more variance in waltzing. There's more kinds of waltzing than there is sprinting. So this high intensity exercise, this, these loads become a lot, these loaded fast movements become a lot less tolerant of incomplete mechanics. You know what is the most stable ability in the whole universe? Walking. Because that is the reason we have nervous systems in the first place, to feed ourselves, to mate, to reproduce, to run away and protect ourselves. That locomotion is the game. We have nervous systems so we can perceive change in the environment. And that is drilled on walking. Our, we decongest our bodies through walking. I think that the easiest way to scale that up without having to walk faster is to walk heavier. So as soon as you put a backpack on, I'm going to challenge your plantar fascia in a way that can't be challenged any other way. And I can easily put a one pound plate in your back and I can put a two pound. I can scale this up and scale it up and scale it up. So you're carrying horrendous loads, short distances. And what's amazing is that it takes very little skill and it is very, very stable and very, very safe. And the benefits I, we, do you remember? the osteoporosis boom of the 90s like every woman oh, yeah. has osteoporotic and there were 10,000 caramel caramel you know chews with calcium like that was suddenly like it was like my my mom was pounding calcium you remember that yep. my mom yeah. too and then we were oh, like yeah. oh it didn't work oops it turns out it's not about calcium it's about having your bones ask for the calcium right yeah that and snack yeah. wells didn't work out remember that <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, did they? I don't know. Snackles are pretty amazing. And uh, if you eat like 10 of them with a cup of coffee, I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. But the point is, man, if I just put a backpack on you and walk you around, I'm going to take care of all your bone density needs. I'm going to take care of your disc needs. I'm going to take care of your challenge balance needs. I'm going to make sure, you know, th there's a, a Russian saying like you're as old as your feet. Like you want to see weak ass feet. You, well, you can't have weak ass feet and carry a backpack around. It just doesn't work. So all of a sudden we constrain the environment to have a better outcome. That's how important carrying resources is to your ability to be a great human being. And it costs nothing. Want to get a fancy go ruck bag and, and be cool. Those are my backpacks. Those are the backpacks I carry. Those are the backpacks I travel with. That's what I load. But I'm telling you, you have a shopping bag and a bunch of groceries that you can start carrying today. And I think that it's that simple. And I want to get this message out. You know, as I approach 50 years old, rucking is one of the keystone behaviors in my success for being 110 and kicking your ass when I'm 110.
Well, you know, Kelly, it's interesting as I've been around the world to a lot of places, Southeast Asia, Central America, South America, the Middle East. I watched the natives ruck. Now, they don't call it rucking. They call it work. They put a, a woven basket on their back with a couple of straps and they put bricks in it or they put wheat in it or they whatever the, the commodity may be, and they walk with it. They walk over mountains. They walk across plains. And it, it's just their normal daily existence. They're not doing it for exercise. They're doing it for life because it's required to do so that they can make a living and do whatever they need to do in their tribe, in their area. But it's the same exact thing. It's carrying heavy weights on their back, traveling for great distances. One of my besties is a guy named Rodney Hines. He's a old specialized bike super ninja. And he keeps his go ruck bag as his everyday bag, but he always keeps it loaded with 20 or 30 pounds. And it's always, always there. So no matter what, even on days where he's working hard or can't get out, he still had to lift it off the ground put it on his back, manage. I had a DE agent friend who used to, uh, you know, he always had this little black bag with him. And I was always like, what's in the bag? He's like, it's a little bag of death. Don't worry about it. And uh, he always talked about hiding the reps. And he kept all the big guns in his trunk. And every time he got out of his car, he would walk past the trunk, no matter what. So even if he had to go around the car to walk past his trunk, he would walk past his trunk. And the reason is that he was training his brain when, when things went bad and he had to go get the guns out of the trunk, right? This is Miami DEA 80s. I mean, just think like what that means, right? He would suddenly be in a really sketchy situation and find himself at the trunk and he didn't have to think about it. If you carry that heavy pack a little bit every day, your body will never have to think about that load. It shouldn't surprise you when you put the pack on because Unfortunately, we live, or fortunately for us, that we're not carrying bricks and, and Coke bottles and doing all the things we need to carry, but it's easy to sneak this load in a little bit air over time. And it is, it's Milo, you know, carrying the bowl. It really is that simple that if you just expose yourself regularly, your body will adapt. And it is an adapt adaptation machine. And so I, I'm with you. I, my One of our uh, friends, uh, Laird Hamilton, was talking about a group of uh, women that they looked at the disc heights on. These are women who carried large loads through their heads, like they carried water and their disc heights were immense because they loaded the joints axially, which is the safest, easiest way to load the spine. You want to challenge the spine, bend over, pick up 400 pounds or move quickly. Those things are, we've got a lot of sheer forces, a lot of things to manage. Of course, our bodies can do that. But straight up and down load is the safest, easiest, most tolerant load there is. And these women's discs got higher and stronger and higher because they've been carrying their whole lives. So they had loaded the tissues, the tissues got stronger. So not only is this a panacea for just having strong bones and community and tribe, but this is one of the first ways that I begin to challenge people who have back problems, who are, hey, I don't know where to begin to build, rebuild tolerance. Well, I get you straight up and down and I have you carry something. Well, that sounds a lot like putting a backpack on. Yeah. So there's this, this idea that rucking hurts your back, sort of like how squatting hurts your back and walking hurts your feet. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I don't think the science bears that out. No, don't get me wrong. It, it hurts. Right? You know, if you, I, I rucked a few times without a shirt on, I won't do that again. And, uh, you know, you make that mistake one time. Oh, it's so hot. My wife's like, I don't think you should take your shirt off. I'm like, I'm going to take my shirt off. And uh, that was a mistake. But the key here is just like so many things, it is our natural human tendencies to want to go big early. And what I don't think we appreciate is that our bodies always adapt a little bit at a time. And what I would say, you know, put five pounds in there and go walk a mile. That's it. That's your ruck. That's your challenge this week three times a week. And then pretty soon I want you to get the daily mile where you put five pounds in as 10 pounds. And then let's add two miles and make it at 10 pounds. And if you give me a month of that, I think at the end, you're going to be blown away at the capacity and the changes in your body. We, we have a walking school bus we started. Kids walk the mile and a quarter to school. We had adults lose 30 pounds 
walking to school and back. They lost 30 pounds walking their kid a mile and a quarter to school and a mile and a quarter back. They were like, this changed my life. And I was like, well, what are you doing? Because I wouldn't mind losing 30 pounds of fat. I mean, that sounds awesome. All you did was walk a little bit. So what I'm saying is it's so easy to work this in. And what you'll see is that you can tolerate it, it because it is one of the things that we're supposed to be able to do, carry loads through our spines. And you know what I'll tell you is that you don't have to go to 50 pounds right away. And I wonder if you have full hip range of motion because now suddenly rucking is a wonderful diagnostic tool, isn't it? Hey, it turns out your quads are really stiff after this five mile downhill that you just did. Well, I wonder if we have any technology lying around that could help us deal with those stiff quads, right? And so I think what's nice is that the ruck can be the core of your movement practice. And then you can ask, well, how much hinging do I need to do? How much pressing do I need to do? What are the other things I need to do around that? And pretty soon rinse, wash, repeat, and go talk to me in 10 years. Awesome. All right. Last question is just a, a roundup. Like any any final advice or, I mean, we'll, we'll plug the Ready State. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of everything you're doing. I listened to another another podcast you did a couple of years ago. You were in London and, and you talked about what you really wanted was, was societal change. You cool. wanted big change to happen and not just incremental, not just little, but the way that people think. And, and I think that you're a great ambassador for that. And I'm, I'm proud to be, I feel like we're on the same team like that. We're so so it's why I love, I love chatting with you, you here. Um, so sort of final, final thoughts. One of the things that I appreciate so much about go Ruck and its community is that it's, it's elegance and simplicity. It is so egalitarian it is democratized. Carrying something is, is free and easy. And you can radically change your life. You want to lose 50 pounds? I know because I have given go rucks out to my friends who are trying to lose weight in our neighborhood. I'm like, hey, look, I appreciate that your life is crazy. Let's load you up. You know, let's let's do this. And um, always coming back to what is the minimum dose, what's essential, how do we give your life back? You know, that's that has really been the driving feature. And I'll tell you that, you know. What I've come to appreciate is that sometimes the the breakneck pace is the glacial pace. That's how long these things take. And I think the fallacy of being a typical modern human is we don't think in terms of years or decades. It's not how we're 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 wired. And we're playing a game that ends in two years. We're not playing a game that ends in 60 or 70 years. And you know, it's really difficult for us sometimes to appreciate inputs and outputs, you know, but I'm always trying to get back to what is the, the most simple change in behavior that is sustainable, that gives you the biggest bang for the buck. And then, you know, do what you like. If you do, if you're like Peloton, yoga, rucking, I'm like, man, that's pretty good. It's gonna be hard to beat that. You know, I'd like you to press something over your head once in a while, but you're probably already in there. I don't care what the, I'm totally agnostic about the way, but I am interested for me in how do these things scale? And for me, a lot of utility is lost in, in ideas and concepts that don't deploy well or scale well at across cohorts. What, what, you know, there's this fear that we were going to kill our kids with backpacks. And I was like, seriously, have you, well, your child, because your child is plays video games all day long. But, um, you know, this is an easy, sneaky way. Like, I'm like, maybe we need to make kids' backpacks heavier, not lighter, right? We need to start loading them up earlier, sneak a brick into there so that we have these robust kids. Don't get me wrong. I see the kids are plenty unprepared to carry their crazy loads. Comma, we are really savage animals. We are savage human beings. And I want us to look at not being heroic short term, but being consistent. And that really is the game, is this consistency and finding things that are behaviors that stick and are scalable. And that's the game. You know, I, I just, Juliet and I just got off the river. We just did a five-day Klamath river trip. We're still running rivers all these years later. And the number of awkward things I had to carry and lift in and out of the boat and squat on the ground and move. And I was like, holy crap, like this is my birthright. And I'm so lucky at age 47 to be able to access all these positions and climb in and out of the truck and lift the 300 pound raft here. And it's just the exposure going to the bathroom requires an immense amount of dexterity. That's not on my flat surface life, you know, and I think 
one of the things that we can easily do is then shape our environment so we have a better outcome. And carrying a heavier pack around is the easiest way to start to shape your environment. Thanks for coming on, Kelly. We uh, we love you. We're big fans. If you haven't heard of, of Kelly or the Ready State, then go check them out. I'll just say, if you are, you're like, this kid's a maniac. Who is this guy? We, one of the things that Juliet and I did through our, through our site is we created a two-week on-ramp program there. So we'll, we'll scale you up a little bit at a time over two weeks. So if you sign up, we'll give you a crash course, this primer about how to take care of your body so you know how to use the more advanced stuff. But if you just cancel it after two weeks, I think you'd be blown away at how much you learned. And then we've got challenges and all this. We've made it easy. We we relaunched the site last year because it felt a little bit like it was the Library of Alexandria. It was a little crazy in there. And we tried to streamline it down and you know make sense of 10 years of data. And it's a little bit easier to use now. So jump in there. And you know that way when your foot hurts, or your knee hurts, or you're in the middle of something, like you're not panicked. You know what to do. You know how to handle it. Awesome. Thanks for your time, Cal. Such a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to listen to you because you've, you've talked about a lot of things that are really important to me. Some of them on a personal basis, I'll give you an idea real quick. You know, when I did 30 years in the army, I did 2,500 parachute jumps. So when I checked out of the army, I figured, okay, I'm going to have a bunch of compression on my spine. When they actually checked it, there was no compression whatsoever. And I'd been carrying heavy rucks all my life, and I'd never kind of put that together until you started talking about it. So then I, I got into some yoga and ballroom dancing. So it's like, oh, yes. okay, geez, this is kind of a confirmation of all those things I've done. <laughs> well, the, the, the magic for us is to be able to not always have a genius who figures it out, but to say, can we reverse engineer that so that it's, we don't miss opportunities or miss windows? Because, I mean, you're, you've nailed it, right? Yeah. Now, now you're focusing on, hey, I've got to keep an eye on this range of motion. I've got to make sure I can breathe in these positions and I've got to keep my balance up. And there's some really easy ways to do that. That's amazing. I love it. My my grandfather was a flight surgeon in Korea. My uh, my stepfather re retired a colonel, was a was an army doctor. And then um, you appreciate this because of what I understood of you at Delta Force is that uh, one of my friends, uh, his name's Drew Contreras. He is uh, he was Obama's physical therapist, came over from the Pentagon and now is with Biden. And so I've been working with uh, Drew, supporting his mission with the president. Now this is my second mission. And uh, if Biden wins, I want to take all of this and aim it at elementary school, and middle school. That, that's where it needs to start. That's where the problem is right now. Yep. now they, they don't even go out and do recess anymore for most of them. That really bothers me. Yeah, it should. You know, I think people don't appreciate that, uh, you know, President Kennedy started the uh, presidential physical fitness test yep. because he saw a generation of people who couldn't be deployed to war. Exactly. Right, right now, not only is this now an issue of, you know, national security, it's also an issue of social justice. So we've got yeah. people's attention. Yeah, you yeah. read his article, right? What, what is it? The Unfit American or something like that? It's, it's, oh. it's in Sports Illustrated. Kennedy wrote it after he was elected, before he took office. I, I'll send you the link or just Google the soft American, maybe. Oh, it's it's an awesome, it's a short read. But yeah, he and he issued the 50 mile challenge, which we've picked up as well. We have a whole event on that called the Star Course. It's the 50 miler. Oh, and in that guise. So we're big fans of Kennedy. He's also the guy that authorized the wear of the Green Beret. So Green Berets love JFK. Yep. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Well, well um, you know, I, I think these societal problems twofold have to, we have to have a structural solution that is at scale. We need the government involved and we need a communitarian approach where it is, you know, small groups of people inspiring other small groups of people. So we, we have to work on both sides. You, you have to have the regular army and you have to have the irregular army. Absolutely. That's the way it goes. One of our big pushes is building better communities. Because you, you build better communities by building better individuals. That's right. Better communities ultimately build better nations. And this nation needs some rebuilding in those areas. Yeah, we, you know, the leadership is, uh, you know, starts with us. You know, I, I really have liked, you know, those guys at 30 Seconds Out. You know, he had a T-shirt or a sticker that said, no one is coming, it's up to us. And I, that really stuck with me. And I started talking about it's up to us. And now lots of shirts are out there and, you know, really, I think that's the key is that we have lost this agency and, you know, sort of the the moral obligation to to do the right thing. So it's up to us. 
You got it. We'll keep fighting the good fight. You you do the same, brother. Let's have this talk again in 10 years and see if we may move the needle at all, huh? Hey. Because, uh, you know, I think that's the only way we can really see if we're doing anything. Again, the glacial pace is the breakneck pace. And, you know, the, the distance you guys have come from the outside, it's so impressive. So keep it up, my friends. Thanks, life, life isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. And if you want to go far, go with friends. So uh, I'm stoked that you guys are my friends. Thanks, Kel. All right, so that's that with Kel. What, do you, what did you think, Rich? A very impressive young man. What's most impressive is he is echoing many of the thoughts that I've had. So that, that's, that's kind of a, a plus for me. There is no silver bullet. I mean, that's bottom line. You've got to go out and do the work. Where he excels is he has determined what work and how to do it in the most direct method that people can understand. It, it isn't any of this, oh, gee, you got to have this piece of equipment or you've got to have this particular whole series of 20 exercises over X number of hours. It's put the weight on your back and walk. Yeah, I mean, he would have been a fine Neanderthal along with us, you oh, know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like the basics. Brilliance yeah. in the yeah. basics. Yeah, that's it. I mean, the, all the Neanderthals came together, and they, they, they lived in the cave, and they would go out each day, and they would carry their, their hunting gear with them. So you had to have a big stick to beat the saber-toothed tiger or the woolly mammoth with. You had to have some pretty serious gear. Then when you kill the damn animals— and you wanted to haul it back so your family had something to eat, you had to carry a bunch of weight, and you went back to wherever you came from. Same is true as you, as you gathered other things, stones to build walls with, stones to build fire pits with, whatever it might be. They were doing regular exercise every day, some days more than others perhaps, depending on how far you had to go to find something that, that would feed your family. They were doing that same thing, and that's, that's what he is a proponent of, doing something every day that will take you to an exercise level that makes you a functional person. So for a little context, Kelly's able to explain a lot of stuff, and not just on this podcast, but, but on his YouTube stuff, the Ready State stuff. Right. So we've been through a lot, right? We're kind of like end users. You, you put a lot of weight on your back. You go do a lot of miles. You push yourself to, to very, very extremes, right? You, you learn a lot, of, a lot about your body the, the hard way. Right. You learn when you can push a little harder. You learn when you have to back off. You learn how to prevent this. It's like you, it's, it's basically the, the physical equivalent of when you're a kid and you put your hand on the stove and it gets burned. You learn what to do and what not to do. Don't touch the stove. Fine line between hard and stupid, right? And you learn how to back off when you need to. And what he's able to do is to kind of teach other people how to go further sooner by being smarter. And, and knowledge is power. And, you know, we've talked so much about the evolution of, of human performance within the special forces community over the decades Right. Since, you know, you, you joined in the, in the late 60s and it's like knowledge is power. So learn the knowledge that you can. Getting injured isn't cool. You know, what's really cool the the lifestyle that he's a proponent of, which is don't, don't trade your dreams of what you want to do later in life. Just train your body. Right. He, he's able to distill that down to understandable levels for everyone. So the maintenance that we need to go through on a daily basis, right? I mean, it's, it's fascinating when you go to a place like Vietnam, right? And you see people in full, perfect squats at all ages, all over that country. Right. They, that's how they just sit. They're, that's or how they rest. That's how they rest. Yeah. They just, they sit down and they rest without actually putting their butts on the ground. They're up flat-footed. They're squat, and they're resting. So, you know, when you're in the Middle East, the, the toilets are holes in the ground, most places, right? And you've got the two little footprints-ish yeah. next to it if it's a really fancy one. The, the bathrooms in, the, in Narita in Tokyo, the airport, are the same. <laughs> and in Vietnam, if you go to the right place, they're the same. 
Yeah. And so when I went over to Iraq and I, that was my first time over to the Middle East and I saw that I'm like, it felt so backwards and primitive. Like we were so advanced because we don't have to do that. And it's kind of a metaphor of sorts. And I remember our, our team leader, he's, he's always the one, right? God bless Walt. I love that dude. But you know, he tried to get on this little crusade, this mini crusade one day and start telling all the guys about how that was actually better, right? It's actually better guys. If you, if you're, you're, you're squatting you to do the shit, squat. right? Yeah. Because it's, it, you know, and what, what he was saying was a hundred percent true. I'm not saying get rid of the toilet in your house. What I'm saying is, is the same stuff that's Kelly saying is greater range of motion is better. It will make you better at rucking. It will make you better at all athletic endeavors in including life. Right. And, and so how do we, how do we go back to our roots as hunter gatherers, Neanderthals, take your pick. Right. And you say, how do we, how do we allow our body to honor its own evolution? Like you, we can't fight it. We, we need to relearn what our bodies are capable of and what they were built for. That, that's something that we've lost. And that's what Kelly, I think, is trying to bring back in a lot of ways. And he, he's so smart at it. You need to relearn your body, the functions, and use those functions on a daily basis to make yourself well. The, the consistency, yeah, right? I mean, it, it's over weeks, months, years, decades, right? I mean, those are the trends that are going to define how you're doing later in life. If you're active, I mean, God bless my grandmother, she, she can barely walk now, right? I mean, she's deathly afraid of falling when, when he starts talking about that. I'm like, that's who I think of. She's deathly afraid of falling. Right. She walks like a penguin. My other grandmother did too. And that was part of their generation is you retire and you sit around and you, you crack a beer, you know, in, in the early afternoon, late afternoon sometimes, right? Eventually the TV comes on and then, you know, the, the political shows come on and you get angry at those and, you know, then it's dinner time and you're on beer or whatever. And then, you know, the wine comes out with dinner. And, and by the time the, the, the political show is over, you're just, you're just rip roaring angry at, at everything. You go to bed. And, and you, you're rip roaring drunk. <laughs> <laughs> you go to bed, you wake up, you have your coffee in the morning. It's extra stiff. You start it all over again, but there's not a lot of movement baked in. And that was, that was seen as I mean, what's the right way to say it? It was seen as what you're supposed to do. Like you've earned the right to not move because you've worked hard your it was, whole it life. It was the accepted etiquette at that time. When I was a young sergeant in the army, I was watching guys, master sergeants and, and old E7s, uh, sergeant first classes and some sergeant majors, they would retire. And the whole thing that they wanted to do and they, they flat stated, I want to retire and I want to go home and sit on the porch and drink beer. I don't want to do any more PT. I, I'm, I'm just going to, that's it. At that time, the majority of those people that did that, a very high percentage, died within 18 months because their bodies were used to doing physical activity and they quit. Now, they may or may not have been drinking the same amount of beer, but they simply went home and sat on the porch and died. And that's what happens when you don't use your body daily. Now, they could have cut back on some of the, the PT, perhaps. They didn't need to run four miles every day, but they needed to move. They needed to exercise to maintain their body's health. Well, that's, that's the thing that's worth stressing. Your body gets better with use. It's not, you're not trying to preserve it, but you do want to be smart about it because we've both done really stupid things with our bodies. Oh, yeah. And- you pay the penalty and you have to learn how to back off from that. And the the point and, and the reason why I'm such a big fan of everything Kelly has to say, he's helping. He's not, he's not the guy telling you not to do stuff. He's telling you to do more stuff, but do it smart. Exactly. And, and this is what you need to know how to do. And so everybody in the special operations community, you should, you should listen to Kelly Starrett. Everyone, basically everyone should. Yeah. Because you're stressing brilliance in the basics. From grade school children through whatever. Yes. Yeah. Knowledge is power. Do more stuff and do it smart. And, and he's a proponent of that. He's a, an educator of that. I really enjoy the way he talks about stuff as well. So it's, there's an entertainment value as well. Because 
I've learned that in, in the business world in, so l let's talk about new product development. If, if something comes up and you say, ah, it's okay, right? Or you're really sort of lukewarm about it. But if you give them a, a very pointed description that they can't possibly forget about how horrible something is, like this is so bad that dot, 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 this reminds me of dot, 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 right? And, it, and it's just horrific. Then there, there's an entertainment value to that. And they remember it. Well, he, he's not always pointing out how bad everything is. Sometimes he is. But it's, it, there's also just an element of he's got a lot of passion and energy, and that's contagious. That's an intangible, and that's part of the reason why he's successful with the knowledge that he's gleaned just from doing lots of crazy stuff over the course of a lifetime and working with lots of people over the course of a, of a lifetime. He brings a realism to, to his comments that you can understand. It, it isn't just a, a structural or physiological comment that he makes. He expounds on that so that you truly understand why he's talking about what he's talking about. Yeah, like make sure your car can make right turns. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You just sort yeah. of get it. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's very simple. All right. What? Any final thoughts? It's so important to go ruck, to build better individuals, to build better communities. And what he's talking about is basically the same thing, building better individuals who build better communities starting with children to the oldest, way beyond where I am right now. That's a realistic approach, and I, I applaud that completely. As always, we thank you for listening to Glorious Professionals. Hope you got something out of this one. Give Kelly a follow, and tell, tell your friends. If you enjoyed it, tell your friends. Get them to listen in as well. Adios.